Welcome to EPG Patshala. This paper is the philosophy of law. The current module is entitled Justice, John Rawls and Ronald Dworkin. The objectives of this module are to understand the contributions to the theories of justice by these two political philosophers, John Rawls and Ronald Dworkin. The module was written by Manvitta Singham Sethi from the University of Ottawa. I'm Akash Singh Rathor from Lewis University in Rome. Now, theories of justice are widespread, uh, global, and have appeared throughout history in various forms. An early one was presented in Plato's Republic, uh, where justice is referred to as dikaiosune, uh, and uh, uh, debated between Socrates and the other interlocutors of the dialogue. Um, now, modern conceptions like those of John Rawls have much more egalitarian and liberal uh, components to it. Rawls sees justice as the primary virtue of society, whereas in Plato's conception and in Aristotle and other Greek conceptions, the primary virtue might uh, be rather uh, wisdom. Throughout uh, ancient oriental uh, philosophy, other conceptions of justice were suggested. For example, Confucius has an idea uh, that's referred to as, as ren, uh, consisting of justice as universal benevolence leading to an overall uh, societal harmony. Persian philosophers and other uh, Muslim uh, uh, political uh, and legal theorists, uh, including uh, Avicenna and Averroes, have also offered uh, various kinds of uh, discussions of, of justice in relation to moral theology and other political theological conceptions. And of course, uh, Gandhi uh, combines basically the principle of nonviolence and the prohibition against doing harm to come up with a, a theory of justice that he offers. He states that uh, justice demands that uh, no harm be done. So we've got all kinds of different uh, theories of justice arising from all different uh, geographical locations and historical eras. But two of the most prominent ones for contemporary liberal thinking about what justice is are to be found in John Rawls and Ronald Dworkin. So we're going to focus in this module on uh, first Rawls's idea of justice and then uh, on Dworkin's uh, conception of justice, which is a built upon and a kind of correction of, uh, of John Rawls. So, John Rawls presents his theory of justice in a masterpiece that he published in 1971 uh, called A Theory of Justice. John Rawls sees uh, justice as a primary political virtue that applies to the basic structure of society. The basic structure refers to the basic political institutions of any society for that society to be regarded as a political community. Now, that basic structure has to be constructed in a moment of, um, of, uh, of founding the uh, uh, political society. And the way in which the basic structure is constructed is the test uh, uh, according to which we see whether that basic structure is just and establishes uh, uh, just principles. Now, the crucial uh, uh, innovation in a theory of justice is that this uh, orientation towards establishing a, a just basic structure turns away from the dominant paradigm that was uh, prevalent in political uh, philosophy prior to 1971, which is utilitarianism. Utilitarianism concentrates on the good of the overall political community, and in that respect, it, um, uh, uh, it prioritizes the overall good to any particular individual good. In John Rawls's own words, utilitarianism has a patent disregard for the individual in favor of the community. So what John Rawls presents through his theory of justice is a concentration on individual rights and freedoms. And in so doing, he attempts to, uh, well, not only attempts, he completely overcomes the utilitarian political philosophy that uh, was dominant in the um, moment in the late 1960s and early 1970s when he publishes a theory of justice. So Rawls conceives of justice uh, uh, in very simple terms as fairness. So 
justice is conceived as fairness as opposed to maximizing uh, the interests of the overall community like the previous utilitarian conception of political justice. How do we get to this just point? As I had mentioned, it's in the constitution of the basic structures of society that should be uh, constructed in accordance with the basic principles of justice. Well, where do we get our principles of justice? Rawls uses a very interesting device, which he refers to as the original position, um, in order to, uh, to construct or generate the basic principles of justice. The story works something like this. You imagine yourself uh, behind a veil of ignorance. What that means is that if you didn't know what gender you were, what race you were, what your social status were, your class, your caste, anything of that sort, what your orientations and preferences were. If you, had, um, if you were, if you were uh, under this sort of veil of ignorance, what principles would you uh, uh, therefore generate to rule or govern uh, society? Now, knowing who you are, what you want, your predilections, your community, your orientations, and so on, obviously we all construct kinds of principles that favor us ourselves. So I belong to the middle class, I'm a male, I'm a Hindu or something like this. I propose laws and legislation that advantages precisely those sorts of people, advantages males, uh, advantages um, Hindus or advantages uh, people in the middle class. But if I'm behind this veil of ignorance and I don't know what my gender, my caste, my class, my community, anything like this is, what sort of laws would I advance? Well, clearly I would advance those that are the most advantageous to any circumstance I might actually find myself in within the uh, political society. I don't know if I'm male or female, if I will end up being a man or a woman in this society that I'm in the process of constructing. So the, the legislation or the principles that I propose to govern this uh, political society would be neutral towards gender. So I don't accidentally disadvantage myself, for example. I don't know what my race will be. I don't know what my religion will be. So obviously I would favor the kind of legislation or principles that doesn't discriminate on the basis of uh, race or uh, gender or class or origin or birth or anything like this. So the basic idea is that in the original position, people uh, 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 speculating on the basic principles that should govern society, if they were under a veil of ignorance, would generate principles that are just and um, uh, and, uh, and, and fair. The kind of principles that um, uh, are generated according to Rawls's work in the theory of justice are essentially two. These are the two principles of justice. The first, justice is referred to as the liberty principle. In other words, it's the principle that uh, ensures our basic civil and political liberties. Uh, once again, this prioritizes the individual over the utilitarian conception because fundamentally our rights, political and civic rights, are the um, most uh, uh, prior things that we would uh, think of if we were behind this uh, veil of ignorance in the original position. A second principle comes to, in some way, moderate or match the liberty principle, and that's, that's commonly referred to as the uh, equality principle or the principle of equal opportunity. So we've got a liberty principle, uh, and then we've got an equality principle, and, and, and these are the uh, paramount uh, values in any uh, democratic uh, liberal society, our uh, liberty and our uh, equality. The second principle, the, the principle of equal opportunity, has a, a, a double uh, conception, the most important aspect of which is referred to as the difference principle. What the difference pr principle uh, uh, articulates is that any denigration to the liberty principle can only be affected if it is of advantage to the least advantaged in the political uh, uh, society. So if uh, various historical, racial, other disadvantages creep in to this political culture. Remember, none are there to begin with conceptually, but given that 
these, um, these ideas that Rawls is um, uh, constructing um, in, in theory are to be uh, uh, a reference point in the way that we actually conduct uh, political reality. Given that uh, various um, uh, prejudices and disadvantages creep into an actual political society, we need to balance or temper this uh, deep liberal claim of uh, freedom and uh, fundamental political rights by something that can um, advantage those who are least favored by the political structure. So this is known as the difference principle. But consider that the difference principle uh, is the only possibility for uh, re the reduction of uh, our liberties. So what we find in John Rawls in these two principles of justice is a very clear what Rawls calls lexical ordering. In other words, liberty is the priority, it's number one, and equality is second. So it's a clear number two. After John Rawls published a theory of justice proposing these um, two principles of liberty and the, and the idea of justice the, that he constructs uh, overall, uh, political philosophy in the United States especially more broadly in the Anglo-American world, was revitalized. There was a great deal of debate, argumentation. Many articles were published in response to Rawls. Many books were written to challenge Rawls' work. Uh, for example, uh, books uh, on uh, espousing a libertarian principle that uh, argued against the denigration of liberty that Rawls permitted through the difference principle. And on the other side, uh, books that attempted to um, uh, criticize Rawls for this priority of liberty over uh, equality. So on the one hand you had libertarian critiques saying that the liberty principle should never be violated. On the other hand you had uh, sort of Marxist or socialist critiques saying that why doesn't equality come first? Why isn't equality more important than, than liberty? And you had a whole host of other kinds of, uh, of critiques. Um, for example, Susan Oaken published uh, a very uh, strong feminist critique stating that in Rawls' uh, original position, the, um, uh, the, the claim that people don't know their gender doesn't act, actually ultimately get played out in the body of the construction of the political society because Rawls always treats of uh, women not as individuals within a theory of justice but attached to family or husband or something like that. So there's a seemingly conservative representation of, of women in his book uh, A Theory of Justice. Taking into account this wide range of critiques from various quarters and, and, and various political positions, Rawls, about 20 years later, published his second major masterpiece, which was called Political Liberalism. What Rawls does in Political Liberalism is makes certain improvements upon his conception of justice that he had first presented in A Theory of Justice. Most specifically, he comes up with what he calls a thinner idea of, um, of uh, justice, which is to say a purely political conception of justice as opposed to one that is influenced by more moral considerations. So now he emphasizes that we should conceive of justice politically and not metaphysically or not morally or, or in any other way. The main aim of, of uh, political liberalism is to achieve stability in a diverse society. When he argued in a theory of justice that uh, we make decisions behind a, a veil of ignorance and uh, we're therefore deracinated, we don't know our race, we don't know our ethnicity, we don't know our re religion, we don't know our gender and so on. This flew so much in, in the face of the increasing pluralization and, and diversity in American culture, mainstream culture at the time, that he realized that in political liberalism we need to take into account the basic fact of pluralism. Now, uh, this new political conception of justice then starts with uh, the basic fact of pluralism as opposed to starting with a, um, an assumption of, uh, of deracinated, ungendered uh, uh, people behind a, a veil of ignorance. He still uses the basic notion of justice as fairness, but that notion is thinned out to be political and to function in order to keep multicultural societies stable. So what he's done here is he's rejected 
what are referred to as comprehensive doctrines. In other words, he's rejected any thick conception that um, should govern society, any thick idea of what liberalism is. So he even criticizes his own book, A Theory of Justice, as suggesting a kind of thick conception of liberalism, one that presents liberalism as a comprehensive doctrine. So just like Marxism is a comprehensive doctrine, or let's say that uh, various theological perspectives about the good life are a comprehensive doctrine. In other words, um, trying to deduce or suggest what the political dispensation should be in the meaning of justice based on some uh, more comprehensive ideology, religious belief, or something like that. Rejecting comprehensive doctrines, Rawls even suggests that what he presented in the theory of justice was something of liberalism as a comprehensive doctrine. So he wishes to thin it all out and argue for a purely political conception, even a political liberalism. That's the title of the book, Political Liberalism. Now, how do you get uh, pluralism to be both stable and rational through this thin conception of, uh, of justice? There are basically two mechanisms by which this can happen. Now, remember that this political liberalism, this thin liberalism, isn't going to dictate to people what they should believe. It's not going to tell people that they should be secular. It's not going to tell people that they should, um, uh, how they should uh, conceive of the good. It's, it's focused uh, fundamentally on the right, not the good, on, uh, on, a, on, on a purely political concept. Well, in that case, how do we achieve stability, knowing that in, uh, in society, in a, in a diverse and plural society, everybody has a different conception of what is good. So how are we going to take political society forward with all of these differing conceptions? The mechanism that Rawls uses is referred to as overlapping consensus. In other words, you have multiple and, and divergent doctrines of what the good life is or what is the good thing to do. And nevertheless, within all of those comprehensive uh, perspectives, there will be areas of overlap. The area of overlap is where we, we can forge a consensus on the nature of the right as opposed to the good. So we might all uh, believe for various uh, internal reasons like my religious reason or um, somebody else's uh, ideological or Marxist reason that um, the good life means something fundamentally different. But we can overlap, we can have a, a, conce a conception that overlaps at least insofar as what uh, the, the political principles should be. So a political principle, for example, that establishes fair equality of opportunity is something that we can all rationally and reasonably assent to irrespective of what we think uh, is meant um, in our comprehensive sense of, of the good. So overlapping consensus allows divergent communities to come up with certain practical uh, uh, principles that don't um, contradict their comprehensive doctrines, but that don't impose their comprehensive doctrines onto ev everybody else. In overlapping consensus, we can find that space um, that was uh, earlier in a theory of justice um, produced through the uh, idea of the original position. So in overlapping consensus, we find an area where we can come to a consensus of what the basic principles should be and what the basic institutions should be that um, institutionalize those principles. Well, how does it work? Because each of us speaks something of a different language. I might speak a religiously motivated language and suggest that my God tells me that you know this should be the law. Someone else might say that uh, you know, my, Marx says that it should be like this and so on. How is it that we come to communicate uh, uh, this consensus in, in um, the model of overlapping consensus and political liberalism? Here, Rawls introduces the second mechanism, which he refers to as public reason. So the public use of reason, as opposed to a private use, is where we attempt to argue our position in a uh, language that is publicly accessible as opposed to privately accessible. The privately accessible uh, language is one that would be accessible to other members who share my comprehensive doctrine. 
So obviously, if I belong to, for example, a uh, fundamentalist uh, religious uh, background, I can say the reason that we should do this is because it is demanded by uh, God or it is uh, stated in the Quran or it's stated in the Bible or it's um, taught to me in the Gita or what have you. Now, that kind of language won't convince anyone who doesn't already subscribe to that principle. If I were to tell you why you should behave uh, in such and such a way, and my argument is because it, it, you're instructed to do so in the Gita, the other person might say, but I'm a Christian, I'm a Muslim. So this is not a publicly accessible language. In order to generate reasons that are convincing, uh, I need to translate my privately accessible language generated from my comprehensive doctrine into a language that is more uh, publicly accessible. So. I need to come up with rational argumentation for the position that I hold, especially if I think that my position should be binding. How a particular position becomes binding is, of course, when it gets constituted into law. So if I believe, for example, that as many Americans do, um, that uh, abortion should be uh, uh, prohibited, the primary reasons behind this uh, argument uh, for these Americans is that it is a command from their uh, religious scripture or their religious beliefs. But if I were to enter a public space like the parliament, which in the United States is, is, is referred to as the Congress, if I'm to enter the Congress and start to demand legislation outlawing abortion, it is not uh, a sensible use of that public space for me to say, my God demands that abortion should be illegal. Rather, I need to come up with rational, universally accessible reasons to defend that position so that everyone from their different comprehensive doctrines can find reasons to assent or dissent from that um, position that can be shared and mutually argued. Uh, a, a, a private uh, or theological reason can just be equally counted by another theological reason. Well, my religion tells me it's okay, your religion tells you it's not okay. There's no, there's no direction for us to go. If you come up with uh, argumentation that is um, uh, 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 articulated through the public use of reason, it's easy to discuss, debate, and carry this uh, forward. The work of John Rawls then, both in a theory of justice and political liberalism was uh, uh, profoundly influential in all subsequent liberal political uh, philosophy throughout the Anglo-American world. One of the uh, people who was deeply influenced by uh, Rawls's work, whom we're going to discuss uh, now, is uh, the legal philosopher Ronald Dworkin. Ronald Dworkin is possibly one of the most important Anglophone uh, legal philosophers of the 20th century. He worked off of John Rawls's uh, uh, two principles of justice and uh, attempted to uh, reconsider the way legal theory is done in the light of, of Rawls's uh, contribution to, to justice. And Dworkin made his own contributions to justice in a series of, of books where he was debating with Rawls, adopting certain aspects of Rawls's work and fleshing out his, his own theory. So in Dworkin's uh, earlier works, he developed a robust theory or strong theory of, um, of uh, uh, equality based on, on Rawls's writings. In his later work, he, he, he attempted to address the issue of justice itself in a book uh, uh, he wrote shortly before he died, Justice for Hedgehogs. He attempted to uh, give a larger explanation of the, of the way that law, morality, and justice all tie together under a concept he referred to as the unity of value. We are going to discuss uh, first the way that uh, Dworkin adopts and, and alters certain uh, ideas of, of John Rawls. We've discussed the difference principle um, in, this, in, in the earlier portion on Rawls. Dworkin begins by taking uh, 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 taking a position against Rawls on the uh, robustness of the difference principle. 
Dworkin thinks that the difference principle needs much more operationalization and it needs new foundations in order to, be, um, uh, to work uh, more properly. So the kinds of disadvantages that people actually face in society cannot be rectified by the limited way in which Rawls permits the operationalization of the difference principle with that priority on, on um, liberty. So in this respect, uh, Dworkin is considered much more egalitarian thinker than uh, Rawls, who's more of a, uh, of a liberal thinker. So, so Dworkin learned a great deal uh, from Rawls, but the lexical ordering of liberty over equality is something that bothers uh, Dworkin as, a, as an egalitarian. The kind of theory that uh, Dworkin proposes has come to be known as luck egalitarian. He referred to it as resource egalitarianism, but uh, in the literature overall, considering that Dworkin is uh, as influential as, as Rawls, many people refer to the, the position or the ideas generated out of Dworkin's work as luck egalitarianism. Now, what does this mean? First, Dworkin makes a distinction between what he refers to as ambitions and endowments. So, Ambitions are those choices that we make that we can reasonably be responsible for. So, for example, if I have a certain amount of uh, money, I might choose to spend it however I will. I might indulge in something expensive or I might restrain myself, buy something cheaper and have a certain amount of, uh, of saved uh, wealth. Now, these are decisions that I make that um, I'm uh, morally, legal, legally and politically responsible for. But while this is the way that Rawls seems to present all decisions, in a theory of justice especially, Dworkin points out that there are also another set of considerations, and these he refers to as endowments. By endowments, he means what each of us wins in the natural lottery. In other words, each of us happens to be born into a particular place, not of our choosing. Right? Not like ambition. We didn't choose to be born poor. We didn't choose to be born rich. Each of us is endowed with certain natural capacities, such as high intelligence or perhaps even a, a lower IQ. Some of us are born um, uh, with uh, uh, great dexterity. Some of us are born uh, sluggish and clumsy. There are a great number of endowments that we have just by random chance, what we call brute luck. That's why he's called a luck egalitarian. Now, how can we make people responsible, legally, morally, politically, for things that are just brute luck? Uh, we don't uh, uh, punish someone who accidentally uh, uh, does something that leads to somebody else's death nearly as harshly as we punish someone who plans and executes a murder. Right? So planning and executing a murder is uh, corresponding to ambition and choice, but accidentally doing something with no intention whatsoever to do it that leads to somebody's death is just a matter of, of very bad luck. So we are, the, the, the way that we punish that person is mu very much reduced. What this shows is that we're not responsible for our endowments. We're not responsible for luck. So Dworkin says, that we need to reconsider the way that we conceive of justice and equality, considering that naturally we are endowed in very arbitrary ways just by brute luck. And while we should be responsible for our ambitions and the choices that we make, considering that so many of those choices are grounded upon or based upon endowments or brute luck, we have to reconsider how um, how, how, how much we peg responsibility, legal, social, political responsibility to ambitions giving um, due credit or weight to endowments. Now, how can we have equality then if we realize that half of our moral or political life is just a, uh, a matter of luck? I mean, it's very hard to uh, condemn someone morally when they have nothing to do with uh, uh, the, the cause of the blame. So Dworkin himself constructs a kind of experiment just like Rawls had with the original position and people behind a veil of ignorance. What uh, Dworkin constructs is imagining uh, a group of people stranded on an island and on this island uh, there are various natural resources that can be 
uh, exploited and used by each uh, person. But instead of letting everybody run free and grab whatever they want, this is a, they're going to attempt a, a civilized and equitable way of dealing with the resources that are there. So each person is given a, a certain number of clam shells, let's, let's say, from the ocean. And with these shells, uh, there we conduct an auction for the resources that are available on the island. So if I value, for example, a certain resource, let's say the coconuts on the island, then I will auction my shells for those coconuts. Now we each begin with a, the same amount of, of shells, so it's all through our ambition that we decide what resources we have. In this way, Dworkin is cutting down brute luck because I have chosen the, um, the uh, resources to which I have access. In the process of this um, auction or lottery, people are exercising their individual choice and making um, uh, decisions that are uh, rational and for which they can be responsible. Now, this mechanism uh, also includes uh, an insurance policy because it may turn out that even though I have freely chosen all of the resources that will be mine, when I see the choices that somebody else has made, I might be envious of those choices. So in order to ensure that there's not an envy that creeps in after I've rationally chosen what resources I'll have from a fair allotment of clamshells, um, uh, an insurance uh, mechanism is also introduced, man which means to equalize the natural endowments and safeguard against inequalities that are, that are introduced through the lottery system. So in other words, it's a very uh, interesting uh, experiment that uh, Dworkin suggests. He thinks that we can, in some way, institutionalize this in political society. So Dworkin argues that we can reduce the uh, effects of brute luck and increase the uh, uh, responsibility due to us through our ambition and our choice by instituting a policy in political society where the redistribution of benefits is made more in accordance with people's ambitions and less with, uh, with the, uh, the factors of brute luck that in our current society always tend to determine what people get and how much of a share of things that people get. At the base of Dworkin's conception of equality is a, f a, a deeper idea of human dignity. So Dworkin argues that um, the idea of human dignity is composed of two basic uh, aspects. The first one is self-respect. Self-respect is an attitude that all individuals have to have towards themselves and their lives. This is the uh, moment of uh, responsibility. Dworkin actually thinks that it's, it's wrong if a person fails to uh, respect himself or, her, or herself. Why this is important within the operation of his legal and political philosophy is that uh, individuals need to be tied or bound to the decisions that they make. They need to be organically connected to a sense of responsibility. In other words, since we've introduced this idea of luck, we don't want people saying, oh, you know, I just, uh, this just happened to me because of bad luck. I, I chose this, uh, I made this very poor decision, it's just my bad luck. So we don't want people reducing uh, their ambition to a kind of uh, brute luck. And the way to prevent that is to cultivate a sense of self-respect. Another aspect of dignity uh, for Dworkin is referred to as authenticity. Dworkin defines authenticity as seeking a way to live that grips you as right for your circumstances. So he proposes this notion of authenticity in his book uh, Justice for Hedgehogs when he approaches the idea of justice more fully after having written several books on equality and, and, and uh, uh, robust egalitarianism. Dworkin's closing argument in this respect about the introduction of the element of dignity is a kind of defense of democracy because his suggestion is that dignity is only possible in democracy. Democracy, he's already argued in his earlier works, only makes sense when we uh, reward people for their ambitions and we uh, uh, start to um, free people from the burden of endowments for which they are not uh, uh, morally and, and politically responsible. So in this module we've covered 
the political philosophy of John Rawls, and we've seen how it has uh, influenced a number of later thinkers. Um, I had mentioned the libertarian critiques uh, and the uh, uh, Marxist critiques of Rawls, um, the feminist critique, and so on. Uh, he influenced uh, uh, Amartya Sen very profoundly. Sen uh, wrote his own idea of justice, uh, building upon and critiquing elements of, of Rawls. And the most important uh, uh, legal philosopher also was influenced uh, deeply by uh, John Rawls. So we concentrated on, on the legal philosopher Ronald Dworkin and saw how he took certain elements of Rawls's political philosophy and, ass and assumed those as um, important ingredients in his own uh, political and legal theory. And then we explained uh, the uh, notion of luck that Dworkin crucially introduces into legal and political philosophy to make up for some defects he sees in Rawls's idea of justice. Thank you.